Hi, and welcome to my channel, The Midnight Reader. My name is Rosiga, and today I'm gonna to talk about all the books that I read in January. I had a lot of good reads in January. It was definitely nice to not be reading 12 books in a month. I think I read a grand total of five books in the month of January which I'm very pleased about because I can actually talk about them in a little more depth. So first I read No Exit by Taylor Adams. It's a thriller that was recommended to me on my Not A Book Club book club from my real life bookish friend Chelsea. And from the blurb on Goodreads, it says, on her way to Utah to see her dying mother, college student Darby Thorne gets caught in a fierce blizzard in the mountains of Colorado. With the roads impassable, she's forced to wait out the storm on a remote highway rest stop. Inside are some vending machines, a coffee maker, and four complete strangers. Desperate to find a signal to call home, Darby goes back out into the storm and makes a horrifying discovery. In the back of the van parked next to her car, a little girl is locked in an animal crate. Who is the child? Why has she been taken? And how can Darby save her? There is no cell phone reception, no telephone, and no way out. One of her fellow travelers is a kidnapper, but which one? I really enjoyed this book. It's very harrowingly written and it's grounded in this kind of terrible reality. It's all so freaking believable. The characters act like people would when they're trapped or terrified or trying to manipulate others. They make realistic mistakes and realistic choices under pressure. One of the biggest criticisms I would see in the reviews is they would be like, Darby made such a stupid mistake. Of course you would. You would make dumb decisions because you can't think every single possibility through when you're stressed and under pressure. And also the little enclosure of the rest area is so like well mapped out in the book. You start to feel like you know every inch and smell of this rest area from the crappy stale coffee to the loose bricks in the walls to the shitty bathrooms. I don't know if you've ever been at one you'll know exactly what they're like. I've been at these rest stops. I used to make the drive from Oregon to Utah and you go over these mountain passes and I several times had my car just like boil over, like the temperature got too hot from chugging up the hills. So you get to the top of the hill and there'd be a rest stop up there. And I've been in these rest stops waiting for my car to cool down as like a young lady traveling alone and it's just you and a couple other strangers and you're really hoping that they're not creepers. <laughs> so I've been there. So the setting for this book felt really tangible even though I haven't done that drive in the middle of a winter blizzard, which by the way, get really epic in the mountains of Utah and Colorado. I really enjoyed this as a thriller. I did catch the first twist. They telegraphed it pretty hard, but after that I was pretty riveted. There are some pretty funny lines in there as well. The protagonist's sense of humor is pretty funny. Like there's a really good line in there about her like dissing her sister's tattoo. Her sister wanted a tattoo that said strength in Chinese. So she got it and her tattoo says, quote, strength in Chinese, in Chinese. And she uses that sort of joke as a lesson to be like double check everything. <laughs> Darby, our protagonist is also 110 pounds, she's a skinny 5'2 art major, and she's found a girl locked in a dog kennel in the back of a van at a rest stop in a blizzard. She's very aware of her limitations. There's a good sort of timer event running in the background where we know the plows aren't coming for eight to 10 more hours. So they're locked in. She learns very quickly who the owner of the van is and so for most of the book, she's trying to gain accomplices among the other rest stop people because she knows if she tries to take this person head on, she'll physically lose. I really enjoyed it. It's a great thriller and thank you, Chelsea, for recommending it to me. I rated No Exit five stars. Next, I read my first romance of the year, which was The Flat Chair by Beth O'Leary. So The Flat Chair is kind of a play on the one bed trope but make it good. <laughs> From the Goodreads blurb, Tiffy and Leon share a flat. Tiffy and Leon share a bed. Tiffy and Leon have never met. <laughs> Tiffy Moore needs a cheap flat and fast. Leon Toomey works nights and needs cash. Their friends think they're crazy, but it's the perfect solution. Leon occupies the one bed flat while Tiffy's at work in the day and she has the run of the place the rest of the time. 
but with obsessive ex-boyfriends, demanding clients at work, wrongly imprisoned brothers, and of course the fact that they still haven't met, they're about to discover that if you want the perfect home, you need to throw the rule book out the window. So I really enjoyed this book. I'd never read anything by Beth O'Leary, and her writing reminded me of Rainbow Rowell a bit. She's just really good at writing two very distinct characters. Tiffy and Leon do not feel like they're written by the same person. They feel separate and distinct, which is sometimes a problem in romances, is that the characters don't feel distinct enough. They feel like they're kind of sharing the same hive mind because they're written by the same author and they haven't been made distinct enough. Tiffy is all like primary colors and mixed pattern loudness and Leon is just utilitarian to a fault. <laughs> Tiffy fears commitment based on her previous relationships and Leon fears change. <laughs> Tiffy's dealing with some lingering PTSD and trying to work through the trauma of being in a previous controlling, emotionally abusive relationship with an ex-boyfriend. And Leon is trying to deal with like his anger and hopelessness of trying to get his baby brother out of prison, who was wrongfully imprisoned. So these are not characters who are dealing with small lollipop pr problems. They're dealing with real shit, like heavy get a shovel shit. And I really enjoyed that about the books. It's not a rom-com movie. Like bad things happen in the middle of good moments and just pop the beautiful bubble of a beautiful moment with real world shit, just like they do in real life. <laughs> I also really appreciated that the reason they haven't met is that Leon is a night shift worker. Leon is a nurse. He works night shifts at a hospice and that's why he's able to only have the flat shirt during the day because that's when he's sleeping. When Tiffy and Leon finally meet, they're already friends because they've been writing notes to each other. So there's a sort of like long distance pen pal friendship that's already been written into their into their relationship. But when they finally do start, you know, being attracted to each other and sort of embarking on a relationship, the thing I loved the most about it was how healthy that relationship was. There was a lot of listening to each other. Beth O'Leary really wrote a relationship that was founded on consent, which was nice <laughs> and something that's not always written into modern romance and sometimes things would go well and sometimes things would go poorly, but they were always listening to each other, which I just appreciated. It's nice when you have a romance with a healthy couple in it where you're like, oh yeah, they'll be fine eventually. There's gonna be some, you know, tension and mix-ups because you have to, it's a romance. But I didn't mind it because I knew they would work through it because she wrote a healthy relationship. <laughs> I do have a nitpick with this book and I'm gonna pick it which is what the hell is Leon's schedule, <laughs> okay? Because he's a nurse and it's strongly alluded that he works 12 hour shifts because Tiffy can have the flat from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m., which covers an hour of commuting both ways, which means he works seven to seven, which is a very standard 12 hour shift time. But I will tell you, having been a nurse for a long time, that full time on 12 hour shifts is three days a week. It's 36 hours, but he's on nights Monday through Friday. He's working five days a week of 12s, which means that you're working 24 hours of overtime a week by working five 12s, which means he should be rich or he should be fired. <laughs> because hospitals don't let you work 24 hours of overtime a week because that makes you a very fucking expensive employee. <laughs> They'd call you off at every freaking opportunity, which means he would have to show up at the flat at really weird hours because your ass is fucking expensive and they don't wanna pay for you to work all that overtime. <laughs> Even if I'm being charitable and saying he gets two hours of commuting both ways and he's working 10 hour shifts, he's working four tens, he's still working 10 hours a week of overtime every week. He should still be fired or rich. He should be making butt tons of money by working all that overtime or he should be fired for working all that overtime. So what, I, what I'm really getting to here is that Leon should be able to afford a new lawyer for his brother. He's just so sleep addled from working all those night shifts that it's fucked his brain. <laughs> and it's entirely likely that that's the case because there are parts in it which 
definitely Beth O'Leary has either worked night shifts or she's talked with someone who's worked night shifts because there's little like quotes in there when he can't like string a full sentence together and he keeps taking like little micro naps every time he like blanks the eyes stick closed and then you sort of nod off, which I can relate to having worked night shifts a long time. That's absolutely how you feel. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm done picking the nits, but that really bothered me when I was reading it. <laughs> anyway, I really loved it. It was an excellent romance. I will probably be trying to read other books by Beth O'Leary because she's really an excellent writer. I did read The Flat Chair on audiobook. I gave this book five stars. Sorry, I had to get a snack. I got really, really hungry there all of a sudden. The hanger was rising. Next, I read another romance, Aisha at Last by Uzma Jalaluddin. From the Goodreads blurb, a modern day Muslim pride and prejudice for a new generation of love. Aisha Shamsi has a lot going on. Her dreams of being a poet have been set aside for a teaching job so she can pay off her debts to her wealthy uncle. She lives with her boisterous Muslim family and has always been reminded that her flighty younger cousin Hafsa is close to rejecting her 100th marriage proposal. Although Aisha is lonely, she doesn't want an arranged marriage. Then she meets Khalid, who is just as smart and handsome as he is conservative and judgmental. She is irritatingly attracted to someone who looks down on her choices and who dresses like he belongs in the seventh century. <sighs> I really wanted to love this book, I think, more than I did. I wound up rating it four stars. That's probably a little bit generous. It's probably more in the like 3.75, 3.5 for me. It is a Pride and Prejudice retelling set in the Muslim Canadian community. And I really liked the idea of the book. I didn't feel as satisfied with the execution, if that kind of makes sense. There's some fantastic lines in the book, including, quote, because while it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single Muslim man must be in want of a wife, there's an even greater truth. To his Indian mother, his own inclinations are of secondary importance. <laughs> That's funny, and it's a great twist on Pride and Prejudice. It's also mixed with a little bit of Shakespearean comedy, which I wasn't expecting. The characters of Pride and Prejudice are spread throughout the book in various relationships, which was new and fun and sort of lovely. Aisha is our main character, and she's pretty clearly Lizzie Bennet. She's got Lizzie's fatal flaws of pride. She's an aspiring poet by night and a substitute teacher by day. Her love interest is Khalid, a conservative traditional Muslim man who is always sort of fighting his overly blunt nature and the conclusions people draw about his exterior presentation. He has his own prejudices, but he's hardened his viewpoints a bit based on the casual and overt prejudices he receives himself in his daily life in Canada. He totally exudes hypocritical butthole at the beginning of the story. Aisha's cousin Hafsa is sort of a mixture of Jane, Lydia, and Charlotte. Lydia sort of dominates her personality though, which I think it kind of would, like if you threw all three of those characters in a blender. Lydia's sort of the overwhelming like taste that you would get out of that. <laughs> Aisha's uncle and auntie take on the role of Mr. and Mrs. Bennett, which I kind of appreciated because then it left room for her own parents to fill different roles. And her best friend in the story also gets to fill a slightly different personality. Aisha also has the best set of grandparents in the world who are hilarious. I really enjoyed the setting of it taking place kind of in modern day Canada, in modern day Muslim society. And I think the conservative sort of love story and the slow burn romance of Pride and Prejudice really does mean it settled well into this world of Rich does, I'm not Muslim, so I can't tell you how accurate some of those aspects of the story were. There's a secondary plot sort of backstage to the romance, which is Khalid and Aisha have to sort of try to save their city's mosque from being turned into an apartment complex. I think my main complaints with this book are twofold. There were aspects of the writing, especially in the beginning, that felt sort of stilted and clunky. And it definitely improved after the first few chapters, but there are points in it where characters just don't talk like people would talk. They would just get really grandiose or hyperbolic or give super long Shakespeare quotes, <laughs> which just isn't how people have conversations. Some of those scenes tended to pop up when the story would sort of swerve back into some of the major scenes of Pride and Prejudice. And the parts I liked the best 
were when you had characters inspired by Pride and Prejudice sort of doing their own thing. Those were the parts I enjoyed the most. It felt like when it was trying to be sort of forced back into the plot points of Pride and Prejudice, I enjoyed it less because the characters didn't really seem to be behaving like they had been written to behave. So they, they just made choices that didn't make a lot of sense, if that makes sense. At the end of the day, I think I would have liked it more had it been less of a retelling and more of an inspired by Pride and Prejudice, because I think it would have stood stronger on its own. This was sort of a case for me of a really good author maybe getting trapped by the parameters that they were writing in. So next up, I read a running memoir called A Beautiful Work in Progress by Myrna Valerio. And from the blurb, runner's vocabulary is full of acronyms like DNS for did not start and DNF for did not finish. But when Myrna Valerio stepped up to the starting line, she needed a new one, DNQ for did not quit. When you meet her on the trail, you might be surprised to see she doesn't fit the typical image of a long distance runner. She's neither skinny nor white, and she's here to show just how misguided those stereotypes can be. In this prejudice-busting body positive memoir told with raw honesty and adventurous spirit and a sharp sense of humor, Valerio takes readers along on her journey from first time racer to ultra marathoner and proves that anyone can be a successful athlete. So, <sighs> I also wanted to love this one so much more than I did, which was so disappointing. And I will say that rating memoirs is kind of like, uh, you can't really rate people's stories, it's their story. I'm just rating my enjoyment out of the book. So I wound up rating this only three stars. And here's why. I was so interested in her story because she is considered obese, which she talks about. She is a black runner. She is a woman who runs ultra marathons solo. She does some cool ass shit that I wanted to read more about. And I, I think it wasn't surprising that the things I liked the most in her story were when she was talking about her races that she was running, but also talking about her family and her health. There were some really wonderful things in this book, but I don't know that I can recommend reading it because it was not an enjoyable reading experience. <laughs> I didn't know anything about Myrna Valerio. I know that she got some exposure from being featured in Runner's World, which is the running magazine to be featured in. And she's a really cool person and she's doing like athletic feats that I cannot dream of, okay? She's a super fucking inspirational human. The reason I think I didn't enjoy the book was because this memoir is her first book and up until this point, she wrote primarily like blog posts or articles or essays. And I think if you kind of look at the book from that perspective, it starts to make more sense. The reason I didn't like the book was that it was told almost completely in a non-chronological way. And a lot of memoirs do because people start talking about you know, aspects of their life and they reflect on other things. When authors do that in memoirs, usually they kind of clue you in that they're going back to a certain time point. They stay in that time point long enough for the switching backward in time to make sense. She didn't really do that in this book. I listened to it on audiobook and I spent most of my time being incredibly confused. <laughs> so she would jump forward and backward in time in her recollections so much that it was incredibly disorienting. There was no like through line thread to follow. Like it's the story of a race or something like that and going backwards in time, but always kind of coming back to some through line. I had such a hard time trying to figure out where I was in her life. It would be like, she has a boyfriend, then she meets her boyfriend. Then she's married with a kid. Then we're hearing about her birth story. Now we're hearing about her pregnancy. Her kid is four. It just felt so disjointed because she didn't really indicate the fallbacks in time nor really pay them off. And I think if you sort of remember that she wrote articles and blog posts primarily, that works in a blog post or an article because you only do that a couple of times in a story. When you're reading a book, if you do that a few times a chapter, I'm lost. 
Like I was just lost, which is unfortunate because her story is really inspiring. <laughs> and it just honestly makes me a little pissy at her editor because she had so much to work with, but it's just not told in a way that's easy to read or easy to like glean meaning from. I think I'm just gonna leave it at that because to be honest with you, she wrote a book that's probably way better than anything I can ever write. So I'm gonna stop fucking criticizing. <laughs> Five-star runner, five-star human, five-star inspirational story, three-star book. Lastly, I finished with a five-star book, which is Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. And I love this book. I loved it so much that I did an in-depth review on the book, which I will link here here? One of the here's. So if you want to hear my in-depth thoughts of me rambling about this book, please click that link. But in this one, I'm just going to give you a short synopsis. Project Hail Mary follows a main protagonist, Ryland Grace, who wakes up aboard a interstellar spaceship with no memory of how he got there or why he's there with two dead crewmates and starts to slowly remember his mission, which is to save all of humanity from an extinction level event. And he is now literally humanity's last hope. Absolutely love this book. I was not expecting to because I really enjoyed The Martian but did not really like Artemis as much which was his kind of second big novel. For reasons that I haven't been able to articulate really well I just didn't like it as much. Project Hail Mary really stood on its own two feet and it was excellent and I'm not 100% sure which book I like more, if it's Project Hail Mary or The Martian, because it's close. It's an excellent science fiction read. It talks about some of the quirks of interstellar travel. Andy Weir is really known for using real world science, physics, chemistry, and microbiology to ground his stories in, which makes them feel less fantastical than things like Star Trek. He doesn't do hand wavy bullshit. For science fiction things, which means that the stakes in his book feel a lot more realistic than other sci-fi novels. So if you have a hard time with sci-fi because you don't like hand wavy bullshit, then maybe try this book. It was lovely and hopeful and emotional and wonderful and I cannot say enough good things about it and if you would like an in-depth review, click the link. So those were the five books that I read in January. I haven't finished a couple more that I'm currently reading. I am still reading Court of Mist and Fury and I am also reading Fellowship of the Rings. So <laughs> I am enjoying both of them a fair amount and hopefully reviews for those will be coming soon. Really enjoyed like a less <laughs> a less dense reading month. I hope you guys enjoyed slightly more descriptive reviews of the books that I read. I hope you enjoyed my wrap up. Please like and subscribe for my videos. I try to post once a week. I always love when you guys leave comments. Now that I'm back to working full time, I usually only reply to comments like a couple of times a week, but I do read all of them and I do reply to all of the ones that are left on my videos. What books did you read in January? Have you read any of the ones that I read? What are your thoughts? Tell me things. Let me know because I love reading comments. Thanks for watching and I will see you next week. Till then, happy reading. Thank you.